The inflammation that we face as we get older isn't just because we beat our bodies into the ground. It isn't just because we're reaching that point where all the things we've done in our life are catching up with us. That definitely plays a role. But there is something that is very interesting to look at. Newer research is really starting to investigate it. And that's how our immune system and the inflammatory response that comes as a result of its activity really plays a role in why we feel the way we do as we get older. So let's break it down. It's already a lot to ask for the body to identify a foreign pathogen from itself. It may seem like, hey, that's the immune system's only job, determine a foreign pathogen. Well, the thing is, is that a lot of these foreign pathogens are eerily similar to our own cells. And they're little teeny nuancey things that the immune system has to recognize in order to neutralize it. I'll give you an example. Like a cancer cell is very similar to a lot of our cells in many ways. And what makes it different is a little receptor on it. Well, what happens is the immune system recognizes that receptor and deals with the threat. The reason that cancers can grow uncontrollably is because they have the ability to change their receptors a lot. And if they change their receptors, they're avoiding surveillance from the immune system because the immune system recognizes something, recognizes that that receptor is different, and it neutralizes it or deals with it. But if that receptor is constantly changing, it has to keep up, right? So there's very little things there. So realistically, there's even a chance that a lot of us have had cancer cells floating around, but our immune system has been able to deal with them before they ever became an issue. Now, on the other side of the equation, there's the side of autoimmune issues, right? Where the immune system does such a good job, but it can't quite make the mark, and it unfortunately attacks our own cells because they think that they're foreign. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Let's get into the nitty gritty. The DNA aspect and the longevity piece, the aging piece, that's the part that's interesting. What happens is when DNA leaks out of a cell, it triggers the immune system because DNA is not supposed to come out of a cell. It does, I mean, it's part of life, but it recognizes that that's a problem. It signifies a problem. So when DNA leaves a cell, the immune system says, wait a minute, why is there DNA here? You're not supposed to be here. So let's reverse engineer where you came from. So the immune system sees DNA and it says, oh, this DNA came from a damaged cell. It, this damaged cell is right here. Let's go ahead and fix the damaged cell, okay? Just to give you an example, let's say you rupture a bunch of muscle cells and that leaks DNA. Then the immune system says, wait, what's all this free floating DNA doing? Oh, this is muscle cell DNA. That's how it reroutes and uses the logistics to find where the damage is to repair it. Well, there was a study that was published in the journal Cell Reports that demonstrated that DNA leakage could be one of the strongest contributors to chronic inflammation, especially as we get older. Now, these whole things, everything I'm talking about here in terms of DNA leakage and things like that, they are called damage-associated molecular patterns, just like the name implies. When there's damage, these patterns are associated with them. Damage, DNA leaks, immune system deals with it. But I want you to do the math for a second. As we get older, we have more damaged cells. More damaged cells mean more leaking DNA or more DAMP, damage associated molecular patterns. More DAMP means more activation of the immune system. More activation of the immune system means, you guessed it, more low grade inflammation happening at sort of a constant, chronic low grade. Well, this has actually been dubbed inflammaging because it's the aging-associated chronic inflammation. There was a study that was published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology that really showcased this tremendously. They took young participants and older participants, and they gave them an injection. The older participants had a much stronger immune response to the injection itself, meaning that their immune system, as far as like an something goes as far as damage, really did overreact because the younger group didn't really have a stronger reaction to the injection, but the older group definitely did. But then when it came down to an immunization, in this case it was chickenpox, the older group did not have a strong reaction. In fact, they had a weaker response as far as an immunization goes. The younger group 
had a nicer response to the immunization. And what this demonstrates in this particular case is that as we get older, our innate immune system becomes overreactive. It reacts too much. And our adaptive immune system, the immune system that deals with threats and adapts accordingly, actually becomes weaker. We're going to focus mainly on the innate because that's the discussion for today. So if we have an overactive innate immune system that hyperreacts to every little threat, that's already a problem. Combine that with the fact that when you are older, you have more low-grade threats all the time because more DAMP. Do the math. So more threats plus a heightened response to those threats equals more inflammatory response as we get older. We're going to talk about some specific ways that you might be able to modulate this, but I want to say a full disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. I am not a research scientist. And this is all based upon research. Some human, some rodent, some in vitro. Okay, So we're just scratching the tip of the surface here. The first one I want to focus on is the microbiome. Our body has to deal with recognizing foreign from self, but it also has to do this in our gut too. So our immune system can recognize, oh, this bacteria is doing a lot of good things. Uh-oh, that bacteria is doing a lot of bad things. That bacteria maybe shouldn't be there as much. And what we're learning now is that the microbiome is a tremendous modulator of inflammation. It can influence it up and it can influence it down. There was an interesting study that was published in the journal Frontiers of Immunology. They took a look at old mice versus young mice, and they transplanted the bacteria from the old mice into the young mice. Once that happened, the young mice started exhibiting higher levels of tumor necrosis factor alpha, higher levels of inflammatory cytokines. They had more inflammation after receiving the biome from the older mice. They also saw they had a decrease in the species Acromancia and an increase in proteobacteria. Acromancia is associated with metabolic balance, homeostasis, metabolic homeostasis. So a decrease in acromancia is correlated with a decrease or a disruption in the metabolic homeostasis, really what we want. And the increase in the proteobacteria is associated with an increase in gut inflammation, which guess what? Would trigger an inflammatory response. So we're learning that the gut microbiome plays a tremendous role when it comes down to this inflammaging thing but we're just scratching the surface, right? So right now, as far as the microbiome is concerned, the general consensus is have a diverse microbiome. Eat your fibers, eat a diverse group of vegetables, a diverse amount of foods, and support a wide variety of bacteria so that you have that just diversity there. That's where the research points right now because that's the easiest way to kind of say, this is good. Now, people ask based on this, like what about probiotics? Does that help in terms of species, everything like that? It's not as good as fiber. I think just eating a good diverse diet is good, but the probiotic that I use and that I recommend is called Seed. I put a link down below for them, more so than it being a very interesting symbiotic that has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one. They're really doing a lot of microbiome research themselves. So I like companies that put their money where their mouth is, like really, really does help in terms of credibility. But they have a unique technology. There's a capsule inside of a capsule. So that's going to help out in terms of colonization, like really working to get things to the right place. So probably the only brand that's really putting their best foot forward with that. So that's the one that I recommend. The link down below will save you 15% off. So just use that code THOMAS15. Again, that link is down below. You just drop down the description and that way you can try out Seeds Daily Symbiotics. Super cool thing, really cool technology. So we have to remember, in order to positively influence this inflammatory response that's happening, this chronic low-grade inflammation, in older people, as we get older, we have to suppress the innate immune system because the innate immune system, remember, is overacting, okay? And because it's overacting, we need to chill it out. One of the biggest drivers of the immune response to DAMP is something called the NLRP3 inflammasome. So there are ways that we can actually work to suppress the NLRP3 inflammasome, okay? Cutting right to the chase, autophagy, the cellular recycling process can actually reduce the amount of DAMP, the damage associated molecular patterns that are released. So think of it like this. If you're fasting and you're allowing your body to recycle components of the cell, that means that the cell in a survival of the fittest mechanism is eating the damaged components rather than releasing them. 
So that means it's using them for fuel, not necessarily releasing them, thereby not instigating an immune response and an inflammatory response. So autophagy indirectly can help lessen the amount of damp. Okay, this is very fascinating. Then there was also a study published in the journal Cells that took a look at caloric restriction. When you are calorically restricted, you are putting yourself in a deprived state, which is triggering a stress response that triggers the mitochondria to become more efficient at utilizing fuel, thereby less potential DAMP. Another mechanism is by implementing more fasting or even a lower carb protocol to drive up levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate. There was a study that was published in the journal Nature Metabolism, very hallmark study, that demonstrated that the presence of beta-hydroxybutyrate ketones actually had a positive effect on limiting the activity of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So it reduced, it inhibited the NLRP3 inflammasome from activating inflammatory cytokines. So we had in two ways here, one way caloric restriction, we are reducing the amount of damp, okay? And then in another way, we are increasing the ability to, the more resilience so that we don't overreact with too much of the inflammasome. Now let's talk circadian rhythm. There are some things that you can do that can influence this inflammaging by paying attention to your melatonin levels. As we get older, our melatonin levels decline, okay? And when you look at people with metabolic disorders, even with type two diabetes, a lot of times they have lower levels of melatonin, sometimes even practically non-existent levels of melatonin. It's a very intriguing. Now there's a study that was published in Progress in Neurobiology. Really interesting stuff that looked at melatonin specifically. It found that melatonin may actually attenuate the brain and systemic inflammation. And it potentially does this by, again, augmenting the mitochondrial respiration. It has an effect in sort of an antioxidant capacity to improve mitochondrial respiration. Now, I'm not suggesting you go and take 100 milligrams of melatonin. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm suggesting is that if we can improve our mitochondrial respiration and efficiency, we have less reactive oxygen species and thereby less damage associated molecular patterns and less inflammation. So what you can do, avoid blue light a couple hours before bed, okay? Turn your phone off before bed, okay? Also eating at the same times every day, especially at night is a huge driver. Okay? Getting sunlight during the day so that your contrast at night is larger so that the body and the eyes recognize, oh, there's less light, now we need to upregulate melatonin. Being able to get your body to increase its own melatonin levels is far superior to supplementing melatonin. So being able to implement these kinds of things can play a huge role. As we look more at our quality of life and we understand that the research behind aging isn't about living to be 160 years old, but more about our health span and our quality of life during the time that we are alive, we realize that, oh, well, being able to potentially modulate this low-grade inflammation that is making us feel like crud really is a great thing because I want to feel when I'm 80 like I do when I'm 30, period. As always, keep it locked in here my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.